In this tier, we will again look at the ways to distinguish each bacterium from others with similar diseases and presentations. Unlike the staph and strep gram-positive cocci covered in Module 1, these pathogens lack many of the laboratory testing methods seen previously. In fact, some of the organisms don't need to be tested for in many cases and can be treated empirically. However, for more serious infections, especially if resistant strains are a high probability, knowing the exact strain may be essential to saving the patient's life. Tetanus is one that is often made from clinical diagnosis. Spasmodic muscle contractions with a history of a dirty wound, especially a puncture, usually is sufficient to begin treatment with the antitoxin. Blood cultures will still be taken, as well as other labs to rule out any other causes of the spasms, but delaying treatment can be dangerous. The tetanus toxin, tetanospasmin, is a protein that inhibits GABA. Locking this inhibitory transmitter causes disinhibition, or inhibition of an inhibitor. In other words, it takes the brakes off and sends affected muscles into overdrive. Of course, with the tetanus vaccine, it is uncommon to see this disease in developed nations. The vaccine is a toxoid vaccine. This means your antibodies go for the toxin produced by the bacteria. The vaccine doesn't necessarily guide the immune system against the microbe. Your body can fight off C. tetani on its own, and the bacterium is relatively harmless, as long as you don't succumb to the toxin first. The greatest risk is to neonates. Verifying all pregnant patients' immune status early in pregnancy can prevent complications and lethal neonatal outcomes. Botulism is also diagnosed clinically. Recent onset paralysis, especially if it starts in the face and descends, is a red flag for botulism ingestion. Otherwise, a history of toxin injections will make this a pretty easy diagnosis. Stool cultures can be used to confirm, but treat while waiting for the results. Cultures often take several days to complete, and you won't have a patient anymore by then. The mechanism of this bacterial toxin is that it blocks a neurochemical called acetylcholine. This is a stimulating transmitter, which is why blocking the release from the neuron will lead to a decreased signal from the nerve to the muscle. It can survive some heat as well. Improper food preservation strategies that don't thoroughly heat the food may allow the toxin to remain, even if the bacteria is killed off. And as described, this paralysis will usually descend from head to toe. Clostridium perfringens is unique in its ability to create a dual layer of hemolysis, or target hemolysis. This is caused by two different lysin toxins. This can help confirm the cause of myonecrosis, though severe infection is likely to be polymicrobial and require special treatment considerations. Confirmatory testing for food poisoning is rarely needed. Under the microscope, C. perfringens is said to be in boxcar shape, in that one end is thicker than the other. Its gas and clot formation on litmus milk medium is classified as stormy fermentation. The Nagler reaction detects the enzyme lecithinase, which can also help separate this from other Clostridium species. As noted earlier, any post-antibiotic diarrhea may lead to the clinical diagnosis of C. diff. Its A and B toxin also allow this organism to produce either osmotic or hemorrhagic colitis symptoms and can be found in the patient's stool. We can also visualize the pseudomembranes on scope to clinch the diagnosis. However, currently PCR is the most accurate test to confirm the diagnosis. Recent antibiotic use is usually the only key you need for this diagnosis. Alcohol hand gels, common in hospitals, also don't kill C. diff spores. This is one of the reasons that this pathogen is common concern in hospital spread or nosocomial infections. Physicians should take care to wash their hands instead of using disinfecting gels, even if there's the slightest hint of C. diff in a patient. Finally, some tests that we may recognize have returned. Listeria is a catalase-positive beta-hemolytic organism. It's the only gram-positive rod that we will cover that falls into this category. With meningitis cases, it may also be confirmed with CSF culture. Though certain words used to be more prevalent in tests, Buzzwords like tumbling motility here and stormy fermentation for seek perfringens are becoming less and less common. And given Listeriolysin O toxin is a dead giveaway as a microbe's name is in the toxin, it's unlikely to be tested on as well. What's most important to remember is that it can grow in cold temperatures, such as contaminated food in the fridge. More important is to associate newborn meningitis and immunocompromised patients with this organism. Diphtheria is yet another one that can be diagnosed clinically. If the patient, especially a child, has a whooping cough or pseudomembranes on their tonsils, the diagnosis is pretty clear. A culture of the infected tissue may be sent to confirm. Some microbiology sources enjoy testing on older test methods and specific culture mediums listed here. We will not cover these in any great detail, 
but be aware that they are associated with this pathogen. The buzzword used to describe the physical shape on culture is club-shaped or Chinese letter shapes. Try to remember these if you can, but what is actually important to know is that it decreases EF2 in the host. It is one of several bacteria that produce virulence factors called ADP ribose, which may assist the bacteria spread by different bacteria-specific needs. As 1 in 5 children that become infected with diphtheria between the ages of 1 and 6 die from it, statistically, the toxoid vaccine is very important. Anthrax is an interesting one to diagnose as the route of infection can vary the presentation, thus the tests that are most useful. Although many fluids can be tested for anthrax, the specificities and sensitivities of each test can vary greatly. If there are pulmonary symptoms, the first option is likely to be a chest x-ray, as we would assess any type of pneumonia or respiratory concern. If a skin lesion, that can be cultured. If there's a GIT symptoms, a stool culture may be taken, or CSF for meningitis presentations. Honestly, this is not all that common in the U.S., and even the CDC guidelines aren't extremely clear, so you shouldn't see any questions regarding this academically. Like C. perfringens, Bacillus anthraxis is sometimes also referred to as boxcar shape. However, it is also called serpentine, or resembling Medusa's head, as well, giving it a variety of vague and artistic buzzwords to be aware of. However, of all the unique characteristics, it's probably the AB toxin that is the most important. Interestingly, this tripartite toxin are non-lethal separately, but together, different combinations can cause edema and cell death. The specific mechanisms have only been discovered in more recent years and are beyond the scope of this lecture. Actinomyces is again made clinically. If sulfur granule looking pus is present, it can be cultured. As mentioned, this is one of the two species of branching rods in the gram positive section. It expresses a white and variably raised culture that resembles a molar tooth. It is also one of the ABC anaerobes along with Clostridium and Bacteroides to be aware of. Though nocardia is a catalase-positive and urease-positive microbe, the main feature here to be aware of is that it is partially acid-fast. The acid-fast test is mostly sensitive for the mycobacterium genus to be covered in a later module. That is why this acid-fast bacillus stands out by staining with a particular stain as well as a gram stain. This is our other branching bacteria, which can be filamentous on culture. Always be on the lookout for a history of recent swimming in open water or an immunocompromised patient when considering this bug. It can quickly disseminate throughout the body. Unfortunately, even with treatment, a disseminated infection is fatal more often than not. The takeaway I want you to have from this section is that the presentation is most important for many of these pathogens. The diagnosis is often made by clinical presentation rather than confirmatory tests that will delay treatment. It's important to know which bacteria are anaerobes, which is acid fast, and also the mechanisms of action of muscle paralysis and spasticity. Most of the other facts are low yield and won't be clinically relevant to the majority of physicians. However, if you can begin to build your flashcard deck and other study materials now, remembering these extra bits will be icing on the cake during exam time. In the next tier, we'll continue our discussion on the basic antibiotic classes as well as those specifically used to treat the microbes in this module. Enjoying the material? Would you or someone you know like to help free med ed grow? If so, please send us a message on social media or via the website contact form with any questions or skill sets you would like to offer. With your help, more robust content can be made to benefit all learners.